Um, today, let's talk a little bit about what non-apparent disabilities are in the U.S. One in four adults in the U.S. have a disability. That's 61 million adults. 96% um, have chronic medical conditions or live with a um, condition that is not apparent. So this is the new wording that uh, we're using. 13.9% um, of individuals with developmental disabilities who are of working in, um, age are employed. So that means that there's a massive unemployment rate for, for um, adults with disabilities. Um, when a disability is non-apparent, there's a fear of disclosure that can be very intimidating, and this has an impact on the workplace. Um, so what I'd like you all to be considering as we go through today's event is thinking about what, what, what can we do and what, what impact might this have on our own workplaces? How do we support our colleagues? So here you have some examples of some of the different kinds of non-apparent disabilities. So let's talk a little bit now about what is neurodiversity. How many of you are familiar with the term neurodiversity? and know what uh, neurodivergent or neurotypical, these are other um, phrases that we'll use. So these are under the umbrella of non-apparent disabilities. Um, and it's a concept where there are neurological differences that, are, that we wanna be respecting and um, recognize as, and as just another type of human variation. And of course, this includes folks along the autism spectrum, ADHD, dyslexia, uh, and others. So today our panel, We'll cover, um, uh, we'll discuss the autism spectrum in recognition of um, April's um, National Diver um, Autism Awareness Month. So our today, our panels are Mike Witherell, our laboratory director, Emmeline Robinson, um, senior analytics consultant here in our HR division, and we've got Martha Ortiz, our clerical assistant over in the biosciences area office. Um, and unfortunately, Stacy Curry um, is not able to attend um, due to an injury today. So uh, now let's um, let me hand this over to our lab director, Mike Witherell. Thank you. So, so first, let me speak as a lab director for a moment. I'm very pleased that we're able to put this form together, and thanks for all the people who have been involved in. I think it's a really important discussion for our laboratory to have, and I'm really proud that we're doing this. Now, let me move to my panel role. Um, so, I'm, uh, so why are you here today? I'm here because I'm a parent of a, a daughter who is uh, uh, neurodiverse, uh, is not neurotypical, and, uh, and so what I, what's happened is that I've uh, necessarily learned a lot about that that I did not know before. And so what I'm really here to do to say some things I've learned from that that may be relevant for all of us. So uh, first thing I learned is how common this is. Uh, if you are a parent and you talk about this, almost everybody you talk to has a story about someone in their family who has some, in, in some part of this, in this neurodiverse landscape. Uh, and you would never know that. I never knew that before uh, I was involved in that community. Um, and because people don't talk about it very much, which is why we're here today. And uh, people don't realize how common it is uh, until they open up about that and hear from people. Uh, the other thing that I learned that I think is relevant is that uh, if you know one neurodiverse person, you only know one neurodiverse person. That is to say, uh, and that's true of all of us, uh, one talks about things like autism spectrum and it could give the, it implies that there's a, there's a line and if you know where you are in the line, that says all you need to know about that person. It, it, which is wildly untrue. Um, the, uh, uh, whether uh, in the group of people who are neurotypical or neurodiverse, there's a, complicated three-dimensional landscape that we all fit in, and it's just as diverse among the neurodiverse as for the neurotypical. So uh, in, in thinking about this and talking even to people about this, it's important not to say, oh, I know what that means, it means this. And people might know, I, I've had people talk to me who know one person and they think my daughter must be like that person, or they know one movie where they saw it, or one, you know. Uh, and, and, and of course, uh, and so she must be good at math, right? Which is not the case, in fact. Uh, 
so, um, so it's something that uh, listening to individuals. Now, of course, in, ta in dealing with people at the workplace, uh, listening carefully to individuals is a good thing anyway, because uh, anything, uh, we always bring our uh, biases to the way people are. Oh, you're, you're in this group, so you must be like this. So this is just one more of those groups that uh, it doesn't, it, it, it's, it's helpful and useful to know, but it does not, not, does not specify who that person is. Okay. Um, and and uh, I, I guess uh, the other thing I would say is that um, uh, our society is not very, certainly, let me say clearly, the schools in our society are not very well set up for uh, dealing with uh, neurodiverse students. I mean, and so that I can say pretty clearly. So uh, it's, it's uh, and I, I could extrapolate to say that most workplaces are not as well. And so that's something that all of us can do better on because in the end, uh, there's uh, enormous capability that neurodiverse people bring to our school, to our workplace, to our families, to our communities, uh, if we allow them to do so. Uh, but um, uh, we do have to be aware of what that means, aware of what makes it uh, easier for them to contribute. And I think uh, the start of that is this conversation today. That's, that's, that's all I have opening and then we can talk in questions later. Thank you very much, Mike. Okay, our next speaker is Emmalyn Robinson. This is my younger brother. Uh, as far as I can remember, he's always been a little bit different. He was diagnosed as on the autism spectrum there were very little research, there was very little research and resources in the early 90s when he grew up. And Kel and I saw my mom struggle a great deal with trying to get him the resources he needed and the support and education that he needed. Kelvin said his first word at the age of five and struggled with verbal expression a lot growing up. I saw my mom struggle and I felt like as a big sister, I wanted to be there for him and support him and find a way to help him. Next slide, please. I earned my first job at the age of 16 working as a camp counselor for a summer day camp for children with developmental disabilities and Kelvin was part of this camp. Many of the children from the camp were part of the, were showed neurodiversity and I quickly had to learn the best ways to adapt and support them. This adaptation helped me learn patience, leadership skills, resourcefulness, and an understanding of how to encourage children with a diversity of special needs, how to get the most out of the summer camp. For the summer camp, we adapted a lot of great activities like overnight campouts, taking field trips, going to the pool, and making arts and crafts. It was a challenge both to encourage participation and ensure that the children felt included and most importantly, monitoring safety as well. During the school year, I would support the therapeutic recreation program for the city of Walnut Creek as a leader for the program with adults with special needs. I chaperoned excursions and I helped to lead a karate class. In the karate class, I broke a cement brick <laughs> and also my hand. <laughs> Some of the other activities we did were going out to baseball games, going to theater shows, and visiting museums. Um, these were great opportunities for a great group of people. And of course, it was always important to meet their needs and support safety as well. I was very passionate about working with the children and the adults. And I came back every summer to work in the summer camp for 10 years. And I worked in the adult program as well. This was really a foundation for my career and for me as a person because I have really fond memories of the participants and the wonderful summers spent with them. My first job out of college was working as a behavior therapist for children on the autism spectrum. We used, uh, the, t the method we used was called applied behavioral analysis or ABA treatment. And I worked with a broad array of children ages two to 15, all with diverse abilities in their home environment and in the school environment. No two children were the same, and there was required a lot of adaptation, understanding detailed needs, 
uh, using ABH treatment. ABA treatment is based on behavioral science, and we did interventions for things working on language development, eye contact, fine motor skills, safety, and other support. This taught me a great deal of adaptiveness, resourcefulness, creativity, and patience. And I had to work very closely with the parents and teachers to meet the needs for each child. Some days were difficult when children would get frustrated and show behaviors, and the other days were extremely rewarding when they showed growth and progress. This experience as a behavioral therapist and as a therapeutic recreation leader helped me become a better sister to my brother and learn how to support him more and communicate with him more. Kelvin enrolled in community college and took an English class. He had previously struggled with English class in uh, high school, so I took on the role to tutor him. I used the ABA training and adapted it to his needs. He previously struggled with reading comprehension and writing essays. I taught him how to, I adapted the class material so that he could learn to read the materials, retain the information, and summarize and take notes. And eventually he wrote his first 10 page essay on his own and earned an A in the class, which is one of his proudest achievements. After Kelvin graduated with his associate's degree, he had to look for a job and had interviews. One of those interviews was with Safeway. Kelvin does struggle with verbal communication, and so an interview represents an interesting challenge for him. So I worked with him and coached him, and we had a working lunch at his favorite place, which is Carl's Jr. And we discussed the interview questions. I quizzed him on the interview questions. I had him explain to me his responses, summarize them. I coached them and gave him feedback and had him take notes in his own words and his own writing. Then after that, I guided him to type his notes and keep them with him and bring them with him to the interview. With those notes, that helped him express himself verbally, feel more comfortable and confident in the interview. And he got the job and now he's been working at Safeway for over a year and he loves it there. Next slide, please. I came to the lab as part of my internship program in my graduate program at San Jose State University. Uh, I also, when I came to the lab, I joined the Disability Inclusion uh, ERG, All Access. And as I was here, Project Search was brought to the lab, which we'll hear more about. Uh, Kelvin was part of Project Search, and that's how I first learned about the program. Project Search is this amazing program led by East Bay Innovations that helps practice and train individuals with disabilities in internship programs. The program also provides one-on-one -on -one job coaching and training in building resume and interview skills. Kelvin worked at Children's Hospital of Oakland in a variety of capacities and received a great deal of positive feedback about his work. Kelvin helped with data entry, filings, website updates, and other administrative tasks. I really love seeing my brother giving back and working in this way. He loved having the responsibilities and he thrived from the opportunity. And I could tell he felt like a value contributor at the Children's Hospital of Oakland. The partnership of Children's Hospital of Oakland and Project Search experienced a 90% placement rate for their first graduate class, according to the website. The key takeaways from my experiences I wanna share with you is that anyone with a diverse ability can have an incredible impact with the right support. Accommodations are often at no cost to an employer and open possibilities for more diversity and more meaningful contributions from a broader spectrum of people. What can be an accommodation for one individual can benefit others in the organization. This is the concept of universal design, that an accommodation can have broader applications and benefit everyone in addition to the recipient. In that sense, I think of it more as an adaptation and it can be simple as bringing notes to a job review, which I do myself. Given the right opportunities, people with neurodiverse backgrounds can make an effective contribution. By understanding the best ways to support them and incorporate their expertise, we can make adaptations and accommodations and allow them to thrive. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, 
I, I, I have been working for the Berkeley lab in the bioscience for six years. I started out as a partial search intern. And after six months, I was hiring. Um, every day I be making sure the printers are filled with papers and that the kitchen is that. I be interesting um, the supplies room to see if what is running out. If we need more supplies, I place the order in eBuy, also fill documents and putting away the mailbox, mail, mail upstairs and downstairs. I started to learn how to use every sub, uh, software to make, make name badges and I had how to print large poster and how to change poster paper. Um, I have also helped out setting up any events. I like the part of search because I've been able to learn a lot of different things around the office. I help I help being able to help people. Also gain to know new people around wonderful people to work at the Berkeley Lab. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Okay. And next we'll have Lady Edos, the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer, tell us a little bit about Project Search. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lady. I'm the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer, and I also have with me the Director of Employment Services with East Bay Innovations, Lori Katonis, and she's going to be sharing a little bit about this program. So if you don't, how many of you have heard of Project Search before today? Raise your hand. Okay, so a couple of people. Um, we've had this internship program um, since 2013, and actually we started engaging with Lori, who's gonna share a little bit about that background since 2012. It was brought to the lab by Kim Robinson, who's here in the audience, so thank you for bringing this program to our attention. Uh, former division director of engineering at the time, um, and said, you know, there's this program I think, you know, could be a benefit to the lab, and um, we've been engaged ever since. Um, it's a national program, so we're not the only organization um, that participates. Lots of other organizations throughout the country participates in this program. And there's different types as well. Um, and they have, you know, this is Project Search, but there's also different programs like Autism at Work that SAP does. Microsoft actually has a Chief Accessibility Officer um, and uh, works specifically um, around uh, adults uh, who are neurodiverse and um, has employment uh, opportunities. And, and, and I think the message here is that you've met one neurodiverse person, you've only met one, right? Like there, it's an untapped pool of qualified talent that has a diverse set of skills. And from the slide that you saw earlier, the un unemployment rate is 86%. So these are people who can work, ready to work, and can contribute, and yet because of the opportunities that may not be given to them, people are not giving them a chance. Hiring managers may not know in terms of interacting. It could even be something like making eye contact, something like that, that you're saying, okay, well, this person is not, you know, confident or engaged, but, you know, I think something like that is something that you should be aware of, that that doesn't necessarily mean that they can't contribute to your team. So there's different types of things in terms of interpersonal that we've been trying to um, spread awareness around. Um, our partnership with East Bay Innovations has been going on since then. Um, each of our uh, uh, employees that we've had uh, for the last six years, um, also has a free job coach, and we'll share a little bit about what that job coach is all about. Um, we've, we started with four uh, interns, and uh, within those you know, different areas across the lab, we've actually hired uh, permanent staff um, since then, so we've had three of them uh, for the last six years, 
and I would say um, just high level of retention. And the only reason we didn't keep the fourth is because of lack of funding for that division. Otherwise, we would have kept this employee. Um, so if you know, if uh, you think about some of the entry level positions in your um, division, um, it could be you know sterilizing, you know, or prepping uh, lab equipment, material handling, inventory, that sort of thing. These are the types of things we want to work with you on and seeing what opportunities there might be. Um, for the human resources uh, division, when we had a project search intern at the time, this person was a floating sort of, you know, ad, uh, clerical assistant for us. So they might not be with us the whole time, um, but they certainly floated around the division and we were able to take advantage of uh, the support that they were giving to the group. So there could be something like document filing, lab equipment, assembly tech, data entry. These are these sort of like back burner tasks that people might have. But if you put them together, that could be a project search person for your division, right? So you know, being creative and thinking about this, um, if you're interested in learning more, I do want to do a, a, an orientation um, separate from today. Um, but if you could sign up in the back and just leave your name and information, I'm happy to invite you. It'll be uh, a lunch and learn and share a little bit more about that. I'm going to turn it over now to Lori, who will describe a little bit about how employers typically engage with Project Search and how Project Search um, and, and uh, East Bay Innovations as the organization um, supports you as the manager um, if you are interested in this program. Thanks, Lady. Um, so we actually discovered Project Search back in 2006. We were supporting people throughout um, Alameda County and we realized that while we'd come great distance in finding employment for individuals, with a variety of disabilities, and more specifically individuals with developmental disabilities or those with autism, 77% um, of the folks that we supported were in retail or grocery. And that did not reflect interest, ability, or the community, and we needed to do something about it. So we went in search of something, we discovered Project Search, we brought it back in 2008. So the Children's Hospital was our first partnership. Um, since then, we've started Project Search at the County of Alameda, which has resulted in over 20 individuals who are now regularly benefited county employees. Um, and then um, the Claremont Club and Spa began just last year. They've already hired three folks. And so through this experience with Project Search and our experience with the lab, we've realized that internships are a way to overcome some of the barriers that present themselves when you're applying for work. Not everybody, I bet most people don't like the interview process, but a lot of folks that we support really struggle. That becomes one of the major barriers. And so we use short-term internships, long-term in internships, not only for individuals to learn the skills, to do the jobs, and to discover their interests, but also for employers to learn more about that individual. And so you can really see the skills of the individual. You can see how our supports work. Um, so we're really loving this partnership, we're loving Project Search, we love internships, and we support now, gosh, about almost 200 individuals throughout Alameda County and parts of Contra Costa, and the percentage of individuals who are in grocery or retail jobs now has dropped under 30%, and we have individuals who are making upwards of um, $40 an hour. Yeah. It's been really amazing. I mean, some of the partnerships with, you know, the Berkeley Lab, we've got the Bay, Bay Area Rapid Transit on board now, um, several health um, communities and senior living facilities, you name it. Um, we're going after them and they're discovering that it's a great um, benefit to them as well. So to get involved, um, if you express, express an interest, we go out, we meet with managers, we talk about what your hiring needs are. So what we wanna do is build a pipeline to employment. Um, and so if we know more about what your needs are, or maybe some of your higher areas of turnover, I, I'm sure that doesn't happen here, but um, it's one of our ways to find out about employment needs. We'll go in, we'll perform what we call a task analysis. So we take a really close look at the job tasks. We also look at what other people are doing. Sometimes we can identify tasks that are taking time away from your key staff. Maybe there could be a position that could free those individuals up and at a lower cost, but at a great benefit to an individual who wants to start their career path. So once we look at those tasks, complete that task analysis, look at the culture of the 
the environment, look at geographically where it is, look at the bus lines, all of that. We go back and we look at our employment pool and we'll make a recommendation. So whether that's a recommendation for an internship or for an interview, for a hire, we provide job coaching support. Job coaching support can be up to 100% of the time that individual is working during that first month. So we're learning right alongside of the individuals. We're in developing tools, convention task lists, and some other really cheap, inexpensive tools that the job coaches have become really creative at developing, which then can be shared with others. Um, and that job coaching support starts to fade. We target by the fourth month that we're there, 20 to 30% of the time that the individual's working, but that's not set in stone and it can go up again if promotions occur, new responsibilities are added, or there's difficulty down the road. So we're there for the life of that employment experience. So if you're interested, let me know. There's information on the back tables. There's some brochures that go into more specifics about job coaching. Thank you. I just uh, want to add something about what um, Lori said in, in terms of support. So Emmalyn mentioned universal design. And one um, example that I really liked that I heard uh, was about a project search intern and, and a job coach created um, a type of manual together. And so it was, you know, like there wasn't a documentation for a process or, you know, something related to the job. So they created this manual. But it was so useful that the universal design part of that is that it was used by all the employees who touched that process, right? So th there's this part of it that, you know, is really not just necessarily for that person, but it's beneficial to all of us. If you think about sidewalk cutouts, right, um, it's, you know, it's, it's an ADA thing for uh, wheelchair users. However, people with bicycles and baby strollers use it. That's what we mean by universal design. It has multiple benefits. Um, so with that, um, we, do wanna, we do have a lot of time here um, and as many questions as you have. Um, first of all, thanking our panelists again uh, for sharing their stories uh, from many different angles, um, from a parent, a family member, someone who's worked with them uh, with the population, and also our own Project Search employee who we're happy to have for the last six years here at the lab, Martha, and a couple of others, um, a couple of other employees that we've had over time. So uh, we'll go ahead and open it up for Q&A. So we, uh, we are um, streaming this, so we're going to pass around the microphone. Just a general question. Um, Dr. Weatherwall mentioned it as I was walking in because I was a little late. Mentioning about schools and the educational process of it, and it's not just the um, elementary schools, it's also colleges that are not providing the necessary tools for these children. I have a nephew who actually has autism, and I saw my sister deal with this for a long time, and it came to her after a while, too, that this is what the problem was, and it took her a minute to learn it because we didn't have any knowledge of that at all in our own family, but when I think they moved to North Carolina, it actually was a different scenario mm -hmm. than it was here in California, so my question is, what can we do to get the school system from elementary school on up to sort of recognize the differences and to address them and to embrace them and to train the kids the way that they can go out into the world because parents are not gonna always be around. Yeah, uh, yeah, those are certainly great points. And yes, I learned, uh, 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 I can say private schools have no uh, capabilities in this regard and public schools, which have the legal responsibility, uh, they have some very good people working at these public schools, and they're completely overwhelmed. And they're overwhelmed, as, and this is part of our the larger question about how we support the uh, public school system and the demands we put on those teachers and counselors. Uh, you know, they're the ones who are uh, in danger of uh, you know, leaving school tomorrow are the ones that get all of their time, if you will, or you're just trying to keep in school. So anybody who's not that in that much trouble uh, really gets no attention. And so that, and, and the other thing that I will say from my experience is it's also even uh, recognizing students who are neurodiverse is a uh, problem 
and especially for girls. And so those, unless you have people who are trained in this, it may not even be immediately recognized. Yeah, I, that, those are really good points. And I, I'd like to add that it's all about the funding. The schools are, are, you know, they're underfunded, they're understaffed, they don't have the resources. I was visiting classrooms yesterday at OUSD, Oakland Unified School District. And the teachers are providing daily living skills and support and individuals um, in the classroom were also waiting to go out to work. So they need more staff. So one of the things that we're really hoping to do is bridge the gap of funding. In the state of California, adult service providers are not allowed to receive any funding to support the, the youth that are still enrolled in K through 12. And in California, it's great that the, that the state of California allows individuals to stay in school until 22 to gain more transitional experience and living skills and employment skills. But without bridging that gap between the adult service providers and the schools, a lot of times what happens is those individuals wind up falling what they, they call it the vocational cliff and, and they don't have any support. And then you have a gap where other things develop and it even um, creates further barriers to employment. So right now we do have a really nice grant for the Wong's Family Foundation to work with the Oakland Unified School District. We have a presentation tomorrow for parents so that they can learn about the different adult programs that are out there. I think voices, the more voices that our legislature hears and the school district hears and the regional center hears that there needs to be more collaboration, you know, with employers like we have here, with funders, um, with the school districts and adult providers, I think that would, we'd see. Um, better results. Yeah, we have a question from a, a remote participant, and it's not directed to anyone in particular, but they're asking how can members of the lab develop skills to support neurodiverse employees at the lab? This is a great question, and thank you to our remote viewer um, who asked this. So uh, we've had a couple of workshops in the past. We had one, I think, in 2017 during uh, October's National Disability Employment Awareness Month. And we invited a speaker to talk about autism awareness from the perspective of a hiring manager. And so it starts with, in, in the beginning, um, in terms of uh, finding employment and supporting someone to get a job here and be considered for a job here um, starting at that point. Um, we're hoping to create some of these um, summaries from these types of talks and even toolkits um, on our new website. So look out for it. Uh, next month, we're going to be launching our campaign for IDEA, Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Accountability, and hoping to have a couple of these types of uh, tips and that type of thing on there. Um, and then, you know, in addition to, you know, just um, supporting people in terms of the hiring process, but even when they get here in terms of a uh, level of support. And I think, you know, just from like a basic human level, um, you know, that, that point was reiterated in terms of you met one, you know one, right? And I think it's just a matter of just as a best practice for folks, uh, you know, deep listening, um, you know, really understanding what it is that your colleagues need um, in terms of support, just generally speaking. Um, it could be that you notice, um, you know, something about, you know, them or, you know, their schedule, their personality. And I think there's, there's something too um, related to um, the fact that there are, um, you know, there, there, there are things that you mentioned here in terms of, uh, that we mentioned here by Janie in terms of statistics around non-apparent disabilities and it's also around medical conditions. So I think even generally thinking about non-apparent disabilities, people with medical conditions, if they have, you know, flexible work schedules and that sort of thing. If you see someone, and, and this is, around assumptions. So if you see someone leaving at three, you don't know anything about what's going on with them, um, that, you know, there's, you know, that they have some, they might have something going on. So I think it's just also a term of thinking about, you know, people's schedules, that we don't know what's going on with people's lives when people, you know, when we say bring your whole self to work. Um, you know, people are coming in with all types of things, um, whether it's, you know, medical things, whether it's not apparent disabilities, whether it's about family things going on, or even personal, just general personal things. Um, I think our general uh, message around inclusion is that, you know, we want to support the whole person, that this is a place for people to be able to feel supported and, um, you know, included by their colleagues. 
and that uh, you as a supervisor, if you're supporting your team and people are coming to you and they're disclosing you know, that they need an accommodation, that you work with them through that process. And so anything like that that we can help you with, we do have our uh, health services um, with uh, reasonable accommodations uh, specialists to work with you through that. So we do have support from an institutional level. But from a relational level, you know, just, you know, being aware, you know, being a little bit more mindful um, and just knowing that, you know, you know, the person sitting next to you is going to be unique in their own way as the person sitting to your left or to your right. Um, so just as a general sort of note around that. Um, let me, on, on that point, there's something that besides what programs the lab has, it's what everybody in the laboratory brings to this situation. Uh, once I understood uh, more about neurodiversity, I, I uh, read up about it, I, I, I had reason to know more. I realized, looking back in my career, how many of the very high-performing people that I worked with were neurodiverse in retrospect. Um, and uh, I understood them better in retrospect, and I probably would have uh, been, the interaction probably would have been a better one if I had understood that at the time. Has that occurred to anybody else here? Has that ever happened? Yeah. Uh, so, um, so I think uh, a lot of this is just thinking, being thoughtful about uh, who uh, the people that you work with, and to understand that uh, you know you, you, what what first appears as one thing may be just uh, even hard to get along with. Might be something more than that, and to uh, actually think about uh, what all that means. And I think once you understand this, you sort of approach it with a different, uh, with different set of, uh, different attitude, frankly. Actually, if I can kind of ask a question related to that. Um, so about, this is thinking in terms of graduate students and postdocs. You know, I've had some one in particular who was. I don't think the microphone. Is this okay? Okay. Um, you know, who may be absolutely brilliant mathematically and a very high, you know, and very hard worker and produce a lot. But when it comes to communication, you know, both oral and written was not all that great. And, you know, I'm wondering about, and given that in science, so much of the credit is who writes papers and who gives talks, how to support someone like that and ensure they have a good career. Yes, that's a that's a broad problem, and it's not just for people who are neurotypical. That as we, on the one hand, as we go to larger groups, as you're as you're implying, people who can communicate tend to have disproportionate influence on that, uh, and so that's something I I don't know the exact answer for that. Uh, I I um, but I think that it's incumbent on all of us who work in these groups to make sure that we make the best use of the people we have and give credit for that. And in fact, as a, having been a faculty member uh, for years, it's always putting how you put people out for talks, how you do things, has to be try to overcome that natural bias. I, again, give you one more example. People in our fields uh, who uh, are, are native born English speakers have an advantage compared to those who aren't. Okay, so that's something, it's another kind of, uh, special case that we have to think about. So this is a very broad thing about how we how we not put barriers in the way of people uh, succeeding. Good, yeah. Good. Just to the earlier point about what can you do to help uh, when you notice these things about your coworkers or colleagues or people you work with, if you notice there's something amiss, um, rather than asking about the condition, asking about what can I do to support you? What are the adaptations or uh, what are the, some way I can reach out and support you, whether it's something as easy as taking notes during a meeting and sharing it with everyone or putting something in writing or documenting a process so it's easier to learn. Um, so even uh, things that are not formal accommodations can be easy adaptations that you can ask to support about uh, for other people. And for, for things like communication skills, the lab does have resources. We have a Toastmasters Club that meets every Thursdays for public speaking, um, but there's also other resources uh, for learning how to 
uh, to develop your writing skills as well. Just one thing to add to that, um, in addition to the support that employees have here and also answering to the earlier question of how we can support our colleagues. So uh, we also have employee resource groups here at the lab. Um, you might have heard them, uh, ERGs. Uh, they, there's lots of ERGs for supporting different communities. One of them is called All Access and the chairs are right here. We have Betsy and we have Misha back there. And All Access um, focuses on disability inclusion. So disability inclusion is broad, uh, both apparent and non-apparent. And some of the uh, programs that the ERGs have throughout the year will be including, at least for all access, will be including both apparent and non-apparent. Um, there are some discussions too around um, men mental health, behavioral health awareness month, also caregivers awareness month, um, in addition to national disability employment awareness month. So there's lots of different ways um, for you to get involved. If there's some specific things that you want to learn more about, specifically, say, neurodiversity or the autism spectrum, um, I think it's great for folks to get involved in these groups because each of these groups gets funding and a budget, and so you are able to determine the programs. Um, think, think, think about the things that you think your colleagues would like to learn more about or bring to the laboratory, and um, you know that uh, the, the leadership is here in terms of the ERG leadership uh, to support the members and um, some of the feedback or input that we might get from all of you. So that's just another avenue for you to um, suggest anything that you want to learn more about. Thanks. Um, as a young neurodiverse person at the lab, I've definitely really appreciated having people I can look up to who I can see certain similar patterns in that I see in myself in them, whether it's things they've said out loud saying like, yes, I experience the same things you do, or people who just seem to experience similar things that I do. It's a really nice thing to see. I guess I've always kind of wondered, how do you toe that line between wanting to ask them for help as a person that seems to experience similar things and remaining professional? I have more of a, of a compliment. Um, I'm the parent of a 17 year old girl with uh, significant disabilities and I appreciate how the lab has been very accommodating to those dreaded calls from the school and texts and things like that. So as a parent, it's, it's, this is really a, a, a good place to work. So thank you. Thank yeah. You. Yeah, thank you. And on the other question, I don't know a good answer for that one. So I'll kick it over to you. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, the, the, the tricky thing about, you know, there are still confidentiality rules around disability, right? So you can't go around asking about, you know, people's conditions, right? Um, however, if people self-disclose, and this is sort of what we're trying to promote is that there isn't the stigma around if you have a behavioral health issue or, or if you're neurodiverse, that there isn't a stigma around that, right? That you're still a valued contributor of the team um, and fully contributing person. And um, so I, I would say if that person, you know, comes out as, right, um, you know, the, the, this is another level of coming out, right? You know, coming out in different ways. Um, if it com comes out as neurodiverse and they're comfortable saying that to you, maybe, you know, one-on-one -on -one or in a group, you know, that's great. Um, and, and I think that's at the point where, you know, say, hey, you know, um, you, you might want to ask them questions or, or that sort of thing. But I would say if they don't come out, but you still are sort of, you know, wanting to ask them questions, just generally speaking, um, to learn a little bit more about them. Um, part of what we are also trying to do with the idea campaign is to get to know your colleagues better. Um, so reach out, have coffee, you know, invite them to lunch, you know, just chat, uh, have, have some time for some personal relationships. Um, you know, nothing wrong with that. Um, but again, I think we're also trying to promote the environment that people feel comfortable to do so. And that, I think that's the main message, that people are comfortable to come out as neurodiverse. I would also quickly add, if you focus on what you can do to support and help uh, rather than individual conditions or details, focus more on what you can do to support asking if I, you know, offering a resource or offering tools, that's a great way to connect with people. 
Um, one universal design tip, um, and that just prompted me, Emmalyn, um, and this, is act this actually works um, from what I've read uh, for introverts as well. So if you're a meeting facilitator and you're asking, you're going to have an agenda topic where you're asking for feedback, you give that team uh, a heads up so that they can prepare, they can think, they can write. Because, you know, introverts, um, and I won't say all because there's sort of like a range, but some people, um, you know, uh, you know they, they might not be good at being put on the spot. So sorry, Lloyd, put you on the spot. Um, but um, we, you know, we, as much as we can, uh, part of our preparation and part of, you know, good sort of meeting management and running an inclusive meeting is to give people a heads up so that people have time to contribute. And if, you're, if you know that you're gonna be asking that person for feedback, also let them know that. And at that point, they're able to prepare and they'll be ready. And it's similar to something that Emmalyn said about the job interview preparation. And you know that boosts confidence, that lets them be prepared, gives them a heads up, and it's also uh, just a good rule in general, even for extroverts. So that's, that's one thing to note. Hi, this is Leticia Erickson. I'm your Title IX, Title VII um, officer, and I also provide advice um, and when it comes to uh, protected classifications. For the question that came up around um, how to remain professional, but also inquire if you see something that in the professional workspace um, that maybe you could provide some um, additional resources with, a good rule of thumb, uh, along with everything that has been said so far, is stick to the specifics on what you observed. So if it's skills related, skills, knowledge, ability, resource that you see that you have a match, and that's how I understood the question coming from, hey, I you know, maybe, maybe saw a colleague that was struggling with something that I struggled with. Keep it specific to the task at hand and say, just like you would with any other colleague, all colleagues, um, hey, you know, I had an issue with this when I first started and this is what was helpful to me. Do you think that might be helpful to you? And uh, as long as it pertains to the functions of the job, you're probably in a very safe and professional and helpful place. Thank you, Letty. Okay, I think, um, I, think I was, I was, in line with meeting facilitation. And one thing I learned, um, all access ERG has been uh, great for me and I've really grown in my meeting facilitation. And I appreciated the accessibility meet minute as, as a normalizing uh, and conversation starting uh, way to start a meeting. And one thing that I noticed at a big conference that I got to go to because of all access was that there was regular and normalized accessibility check-ins mm -hmm. and ways for people to speak up at the end of a meeting, um, you know, just as part of the closing, either right now you can uh, let us know something that could work for you better, or here's an offline, more confidential way where you can give us feedback about accessibility. And because I was at a conference where that was normalized and repeated again and again, um, I've tried to do that more in my meetings and Sometimes I just time out like this, the, I mean, this auditorium we know privileges people who can, you know, get up to the, to get up to the stage. So right. when you're, when you're thinking about facilitating and th some, uh, an event, just imagining how to really include people from all parts of the room and not necessarily the extroverts or the folks right. who will uh, pop up and, and participate in that really um, demonstrative way. So offline, per uh, online participation is, is also a really good thing. Great, thanks Kat. Any questions remotely? Oh, I think we have one in the back. <clears throat> um, yeah, um, I, my question is kind of around um, which side of the house kind of the accommodations is made and with the jobs training program how do you balance both um enabling a person to be successful by while still not um kind of forcing masking and kind of trying to play as you know neurotypical when that's mm. more harm than it's doing like how do you find that balance from a jobs training standpoint are are you uh, just wondering are you talking specifically about project search or just uh, that's how it came up, but I, I know this, like, even in um, accommodations in the workplace that aren't necessarily just like, how do, how do we find that balance for, we should both be reaching out to kind of find that middle ground. Sure. So 
when you're working with an individual who has job coaching support, whether it's through an internship or through a direct hire, the job coach is there with the individual learning the job, but the job coach is also checking in with the employer. Um, you know, if there's anything else that the employer would like the individual to learn, making sure that they're there when new tasks are introduced. Um, at, often at the start of a new um, collaboration and supporting an individual, we'll provide a training to the direct staff. Sometimes the individual that we're supporting will actually come and share what is the best way for me to learn? What is the best way for you to support me? And I really like for that to come from that individual in their words. A lot of the time the individual doesn't want to be the person that's sharing the information. So I'll sit with them and we'll write something out. So I think that really makes that, that team feel more comfortable knowing, okay, somebody's coming in, it's a little different. They're bringing somebody with them that doesn't work here. They're gonna be a job coaching support. They're gonna learn everything we're doing, but they're not gonna do the job. It's unusual, but it's really effective. And to, to introduce that piece into it can really help. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but there is a lot of communication. And um, I wanna emphasize that one of the goals of the job coaching team is to not put additional work on employers or managers. So um, while we don't wanna interfere with that employer-employee relationship, we want that communication to happen directly between the individual and their mentor or their supervisor. Um, we really don't want to, to, to add additional work onto the plate, so. And I just want to add the job coach isn't just for the project search employee, it's also for the supervisor as well, because um, sometimes there might be, you know, it's like, how do I, you know, deliver difficult news or a challenge or how do I introduce a new project or, you know, and so I've actually worked with a job coach who've, who's coached me um, in terms of working with neurodiverse individuals. And so I think it's, it's been beneficial all around and just such a gift um, that we've been able to um, partner with East Bay Innovations in this way. Any other final questions, comments? Um, so I'm Misha Gonzalez. I work in facilities uh, engineering. I am a certified access specialist and our architectural SME. I am also a co-chair, as, as mentioned, of the All Access Employee Resource Group with Betsy McCowan. Uh, I um, have a quick question for the group after a plug um, <laughs> for uh, the All Access Employee Resource Group. Uh, our quarterly meeting is coming up on the 30th of this month. Uh, we have all of our uh, core meetings uh, posted on the lab calendar for the coming year. And um, we touch on a lot of topics, so I won't get into all the wonderful topics we covered, but I've found it to be a really marvelous, marvelous uh, learning space. And um, if you want to learn more or guide what we learn about, uh, attending our quarterly meeting is a great place to start. We have three core initiatives this year, but we're all very open and excited to expand those. Uh, and uh, learn together. So my question is for the, the panelists, uh, have you had any experiences that you'd like to share either as a neurodiverse person or a neurodiverse adjacent or family member, parent, um, like just kind of aha moments. Uh, I think it is really challenging to figure out when there's like a round peg square hole situation and learning and compassion and curiosity is so important on all ends. But uh, any aha moments you would, can share about those insights and, and how they came about? I think for me, working with my brother and seeing him develop, um, you know, growing up, I was pretty bossy. And so I would yell at him a lot to clean the dishes, do this, do this, do this. And that, that approach just doesn't work, just doesn't work. And we would end up fighting and it was just frustrating. And so I don't know the exact moment, but I felt like there was a time where I finally realized, hey, I have this training, I have this background, this educational background, I have this work experience, why don't I leverage that with my own brother? And 
everything became so much easier. So like, so there was reinforcement principles and behaviorism, right? So instead of yelling, go empty the dishwasher, I would say, hey, Calvin, we'd appreciate it if you could empty the dishwasher so that we could have dishes for dinner. And then after it's done, reinforcing it, saying, thank you, really appreciate your help. Um, so just those reinforcement principles that really bring it into everyday interactions, just realizing how much easier it is to interact with him and how much more positive our relationship is and just how much better things have gone between us. So I can just say the thing that I learned is from uh, working with my daughter, there are a lot of things I learned there that make me better at my job here. Mm -hmm. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um, oh, I want to just share a little bit about my brother. So I learned a lot about the employment search from my brother and um, growing up as he became old enough to get a job and my father really struggled to work with him to figure out, well, what was the best job match? My brother was so great at sports and stats and he could rattle off anything, you know? And so my dad thought, whoa, sports bar. I'll send him to bartending school. So he did, <laughs> but my brother's not very social. And so he got this job in a bar, sports bar, and um, they put him in the back making pizzas. So as I got older, I started to work with, he, he works for the Sacramento River Cats now. He loves it. He's an usher. Um, and um, he's, he's so great at it. He does a lot of other things. But what I learned from that experience is that a lot of folks don't have a really good grasp of what's out there. We all learn from our friends and our family members what type of jobs they have. And then we kind of base interests on that. And so career exploration is really important. and. Um, I guess that's that's my takeaway from all of that. <laughs> Thank you. So, okay. Well, um, let's. Um, if you can, can you fill out the rest of your survey either using the QR code or the paper survey? And if you haven't. If you don't have a copy, we'd be happy to get one to you. I want to thank our panelists today. Let's give them one more hand. And and if you're in. Uh, if you're an All Access ERG member, could you raise your hand? Thank you, all of you as well. Lori, and I'd also like to thank Sarah Lynn as one of the job coaches over at the East Bay Innovations. Um, and then some final thanks to Diane Wentworth at um, the Strategic Communications, and also Miles and Carlos up in the booth and those folks online. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again at another diversity, equity, and inclusion event. So have a great day.